Good afternoon, everybody. Good Friday afternoon, um, just before the weekend here. Uh, so glad everybody could join us. Looks like it's going to be a, a nicer weekend than we've had in a couple, which uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to. I want to welcome all of you uh, for joining us today for our, our Ask Set Anything uh, event for IT. Uh, we're very pleased to have over 200 people register for the event. Um, looks like we're currently yeah, sitting at 224 participants. That's fantastic. Um, and we know that we have great representation from uh, across the faculties and central units. So again, thank you everybody for being here. I'd like to first begin with our treaty acknowledgement. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant communities. Um, we're going to talk today uh, about SET in the context of, uh, of IT, um, but just as a, a bit of an opening, um, you know, co collectively, we, we must become more efficient and responsive to the changing needs of our institution, um, while better designing our administrative structures so that we can continue to support our core teaching and research mission. Um, while the new operating model will ensure that we can operate uh, efficiently and effectively within our new budget reality, a very important goal for us um, throughout this is to create a vibrant and healthy working environment that provides staff with meaningful work, engaging experiences, and fulfilling career paths. So I'd like everybody to keep that in mind as we work through our questions and answers today. I want to recognize and acknowledge that we're all experiencing different and often uh, difficult emotions during this time, but want to uh, reassure you that your feelings matter and, uh, and that we are truly all in this together. University has many resources to support us through this change uh, and uh, would refer you please to uh, the faculty and staff section of the University of Alberta for uh, information on how to access resources. And uh, please do reach out if, uh, if you need some assistance or, or somebody to talk to. Uh, the changes being made by implementing the new model are significant and, uh, and I certainly recognize that they do affect each of you. Um, you all, we all uh, in the institution make valuable contributions to the success of the university and we wanna create structures in which you can uh, continue your great work so that you uh, uh, can continue to uh, prosper and achieve your career aspirations. Um, some of you might have questions about what this restructuring means for your positions, of course, uh, what does it mean to move to the center um, and what are your career growth opportunities? Throughout the process of implementing our model, we do commit to continuing to share timely, transparent and uh, truthful information about the plan and the steps that we're taking. Um, not all of the answers are known yet and uh, many steps are still being thought through, but we will share what we can today um, and answer as many questions as we can. We, uh, we plan to have ongoing Ask Set Anything um, sessions um, for the different functions like uh, the one here today for IT, as well as more general for, uh, for support staff across the organization. Uh, information will also be shared through the UAT website as it becomes available, as well as on our uh, IT stream webpage. I'll be acting as a moderator for today's session. Um, my name is Todd Gilchrist, for those of you that I haven't met yet, uh, Vice President of University Services and Finance. Um, we have brought together a, a panel um, for today's uh, session. And before we get started, I would just like to quickly introduce everybody. We will start with uh, Dr. Mike McGregor, Associate VP and Chief Information Officer and Administrative Co-Sponsor of the IT Workstream. Dr. Kyle Murray, Vice Dean, Alberta School of Business. Thank you for joining us today, Kyle. We have Rob Monroe, Executive Lead for uh, the Service Excellence Transformation Initiative. Brian Stewart, Program Director, Administrative Transformation, which is one of the components of the Service Excellence Transformation. Glenn Sabich, Project Manager IT, Service Excellence Transformation. And last but certainly not least, Annette McPherson, 
uh, HR specialist lead with, uh, with SEP, Service Excellence Transformation. Welcome uh, to our panelists. Um, we will uh, go to the first slide. We're here to talk about IT. Mike will talk about that in just a moment. Um, this is the visual representation of our, um, of our service delivery model. And I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, over on the left, of course, you have the U of A community. That's um, all stakeholders. Um, oftentimes, when we, when we think about what the set um, transformation is doing, we think about this transaction hub sort of in your, in your bottom right-hand side here. It's what we collectively refer to as a shared services. That would be the transaction hub itself and the, and the staff service center. And while of, while of course very important to the successful operation of, uh, of the new service delivery model or the, the operating model, um, uh, as to our, our service partners um, up here in the, in the top, uh, sort of top left uh, quadrant of your screen, those are the, the strategic interface or one of the strategic interfaces um, with the organization will, will be the, the front facing um, uh, live, with, uh, live with clients sort of every day um, resources and work with clients every day. Uh, and as well, the uh, centers of expertise where our, our policy strategy and, and standards um, exist. So did just want to draw your attention to that. Um, and I will uh, pass it over to Mike now for his opening comments. And, and Mike will also talk a little bit further about the, uh, the IT service delivery model picture. Mike, over to you. Thanks very much, Todd. And everyone, thanks very much for making time to be here today. I know uh, there's lots going on and uh, your time is super valuable and very much appreciated. So as you're all very likely aware, the IT stream within SET is well underway. The IT discovery phase, which engaged many of you in faculties and units across the university, wrapped up at the start of the new year. Thank you very much to those of you who participated in completing the discovery workbooks. I know there were lots of competing priorities and we very much appreciate you getting the workbook submissions completed in time. It's really helped inform the process and will really guide us as we proceed. Over the last month, we've been very focused on analyzing the findings from that discovery, determining priorities, and developing an IT service transition roadmap. That roadmap will be ready for release at the beginning of March, at the beginning of next, next month, coming up very quickly here. The, the slide that you'll see now on your screen is similar to, but also different in some respects from the general model that Todd talked you through. Over on the top right-hand side here, you'll see the six centers of expertise that have been, def been defined within the IST uh, operating model and within the IST organizational structure. So we just recently went through a restructuring along these lines. On the left, we'll start with enterprise applications. So that's the area you'll all know and love PeopleSoft, as well as some of the other enterprise applications, Arise, electronic documents management, and so on. That's all in the enterprise applications area. Digital infrastructure is perhaps what most people will immediately think of when they first think of IT. That's networks, servers, storage, all of that supporting infrastructure that all the other services are derived from. There's a new portfolio here right in the middle, IT service excellence. So as we're working through the service excellence transformation, it seemed really important to me and really appropriate to have a place within IST that embodied, that housed, and that supported a continuous ability to push forward with service excellence. So that service excellence isn't a, isn't a one day wonder, but something that is actually embedded within, encoded within the central IT unit. The third center of excellence is the chief information security officers area the CISO, uh, the person that helps ensure the integrity of all of our systems and data. 
The Digital Learning Environment Center of Excellence is the area that, for example, houses Moodle, houses E-Class, also takes care of uh, delivering student uh, surveys, student evaluations of teaching, and supports the classrooms and labs. And then finally, furthest over on the right is research computing. And that's perhaps best known for support of the advanced research computing facilities across the nation, across Canada. Uh, lots of computational intensive work gets done on those national platforms. They also do a substantial amount of regular training three times a year to bring in skills and, and get new researchers started. And we'll be expanding that area a bit in terms of what we'll do in uh, supporting research. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Over on the left hand side, you'll see the service partner icon. This is, a, this is perhaps the place where the IT service structure is different from HR and finance. HR and finance, the service partners are transactional in nature. They will actually complete interactions, complete transactions for staff, students, faculty. There are a large number of service partners allocated to HR and finance. In IT, however, we've been allocated six service partners. Four of those will fulfill roles in strategic interactions between the colleges and the three independent faculties and central IT. So it'll be these four IT service partners that manage the strategy for colleges, that manage the strategic interactions and direction for colleges and help move the institution forward in a collaborative manner. The other two service partners not pictured here will be in the research computing area. They'll be responsible for creating, supporting, sustaining communities of interest in research support. And I can talk more about why that is if, if you're interested as we go on here. We're still working on the IT roles for the transaction processing hub. So over in the bottom right hand side here, uh, you'll see certainly in here in the processing hub, we'll have support for conferencing and telephones. There'll be the first sort of levels of end user support. So self-service, chatbot, basic remote support will all be supported through the transaction processing hub. And then there's something interesting at the very bottom there, you'll see business capability and process automation. So this is where some of you may have been involved with some of the process automation, robotic process automation that's been created over these last few months to simplify and streamline services. That kind of activity is something that'll be created, supported, shared through the processing hub and through the shared services area. So that's a fair bit to digest in terms of structure and function. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any, any clarification, questions of clarification, if you need those now or later by email or chat as, as would be helpful for you. So we've got a model, we've done discovery. We've got a, a reasonable idea for what is out there in the way of resources, services and support across the university. The next phase of the IT stream is the transition of IT services. This is the stage where the SET project team, so you'll see a lot more of Glenn Sabatier, they'll engage with those of you in faculties and units to work out the plan, to create the plan, to transition IT services into this new model. We've got a lot of work ahead of us to do that, of course. And we appreciate your patience and thoughtfulness and participation as we plan those next phases. That's what I had for sort of introductory structuring comments. Uh, Kyle Murray though has got a fair bit of experience with centralized IT services and uh, has some comments for us now. Well, thanks Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. 
as Mike said, I'm, I think I'm part of this session because the School of Business did successfully transition to a more centralized support model a few years ago. Uh, we've been very happy with the service and the, especially the flexibility of that centralized approach. Um, it, as Vice Dean, it was a big part of the, the move to um, a more centralized IT solution was that it provided us with significant cost savings. We actually cut our costs by to about a third of, of the previous costs. And some of them were, were big changes, some were small changes. Uh, a lot of it was just really good advice. For example, we transitioned our learning management system from Blackboard, which we used to support ourselves internally um, to E-Class. Uh, that made a big difference. It saved us more than half a million dollars every year um, since then. Uh, but it also really helped us move forward in terms of our uh, blended learning and remote learning and, and some of the technological capabilities that we either didn't have a Blackboard or, or really just um, didn't like the, offer, the offering that, that was there. Uh, we also benefited quite a bit from risk mitigation. And you know, for us, we were uh, sort of a mid-sized faculty. And so we were running our own servers. If those servers went down or something happened um, off hours, we had a real problem. Similarly with our uh, learning management system, anything that went wrong, we really didn't have a centralized uh, support hub the same way that we do now. Uh, and we didn't have anyone else on campus using the same technology. So we, we kind of felt we were on our own or, or we had to work just one-on-one -on -one with the vendor. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you there's no bumps in the road or there's never any uh, issues with IT performance, but I, I think we found that the centralized solution has worked a lot better than it, our own internal solution um, our own internal IT group had work. And we I've really come to value the advice and support that IST provides, which ranges from keeping our classrooms running to our research computing, um, to software decisions and, uh, and some of the other things that we do. Um, so overall, obviously I'm, I'm a convert to the centralized IT support and I'm probably not the person um, you're gonna wanna ask most of your questions of today, uh, but I'm happy to talk to our experience. Thank you, Mike and Kyle, for getting us rolling there. I, I will just point out, if people haven't seen yet in the uh, in the chat, um, questions that are submitted to the co-host, post your questions here section. Um, that does not mean that those questions will necessarily be answered um, in this session, but we will certainly get them back to you. Your, your best bet in just a moment here will be to, uh, to put up your hand um, if you have a question, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, on the topic of questions, uh, just to get us rolling here, I'm pleased to welcome Broderick Wood, Manager of Research IT in the Department of Computing Science in the Faculty of Science to, uh, to our session today. Um, welcome, uh, Broderick. Uh, as, as has become sort of the, uh, the tradition in these sessions, we do invite somebody to, to get us going um, and ask the first question. And so, Broderick, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Todd. Um, so. To get it started, my big thing was I wanted to clear up a few things that just get the blunt answers that some of us really want. So my question is about the organizational structure of the central IT unit and the future of our various IT people on campus. There are some assumptions that need to be addressed before we get to the real meat of the question though, so it's kind of a multi-part question. So okay. hope I'm not breaking the rules. Is IST to become these, the central IT organization for campus? or will a new IT organization be created and IST would just be a part of this new organization? If IST is to be the central IT organization, will it be restructured or will its structure remain the same? If IST is to stay the same, should a majority of the IT staff that are currently external to IST expect to be placed in these existing IST teams based on their current activities? i.e. someone doing Linux admin goes to SA1, Windows admin goes to SA2, test side, et cetera. How will you deal with staff whose current tasks do not fit within the parameters of the current teams within IST and the various tasks they are currently performing that are outside of those scopes? So thanks, uh, thanks Broderick. Um, there's a fair bit there. I'm gonna I'm going to try to answer first, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, to Mike, of course, for uh, for any additions. And there might be some follow-ons that are related to Broderick's questions that uh, that others might choose to uh, to mention as well. So, 
Um, so if I caught it all, uh, part number one uh, or question number one is essentially is IST um, to become the central IT organization for campus or will there be something new? I'll maybe combine that with number two, which is, uh, as I heard it, is if IST is to be the central IT organization, will it be restructured or will it remain the same? So, uh, so in short, yes, IST will be the central IT organization for the university. Um, IST has recently completed a, a reorganization um, as have all the units in my portfolio, for that matter, the, the USF uh, University Services and Finance portfolio. And this was all done in coordination with the, you know, the new guiding principles, if you will, of, of SET and our org design principles to ensure that the new structures are cohesive, um, fit the new operating model, and will provide the services needed to support um, the university, the institution um, into the future. We will be sharing more information on, uh, on the IST structure soon, um, as well as with the rest of the, the USF portfolio. Um, I know that Mike is, I think, in the, in the works of that right now as we speak. Um, the third part of your question, if I captured it right, is that if IST is to stay the same, should a majority of the IT staff that are currently external to IST expect to be placed within the existing teams based on their current activities? Um, I think the answer to that is that staff within the faculties and units will not be sort of quote unquote placed within um, existing teams within uh, IST as per the previous question and response. There's a new organizational structure um, for IST and, and additional resourcing requirements um, uh, and services will be uh, uh, centralized through, through an expression of interest as that new structure is, um, is built out. And I think number four was, um, how will we deal with staff whose current tasks do not fit within the parameters of the current teams within IST and the various tasks that they're currently performing? Um, I think what I would add to what I've already said is that um, as we develop a further understanding through the discovery process, um, which for, for IT is well underway, um, and we learn about the services offered in the units and and of course, through discussion with the areas, we can identify what services are transitioning and, and how those will be resourced. Um, so, so thanks, uh, Broderick. Mike, is there anything that you would add to that before we go to questions? Thanks, Todd. Yeah, I, I would. The, the overall goal with SET is to have that single front face for students, staff, and faculty. And IT falls within that. So while IST will be the central IT support unit, that, that client-facing part of IT, a large part of that will come out through shared services, will come out through the Student Service Center for students and for the staff service center for staff and faculty. So, so yes, IST will be the central IT unit. How will that look to everybody in the university though? that look, that, that user experience will be very much structured by, by the set initiative overall, by the way that services, HR, finance, and IT will be rolled out. So I think that was the only thing I wanted to add, Todd. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, uh, thank you Broderick. Um, I think Broderick wins the uh, award so far for the most questions fit into the opening question. <laughs> Well done. Uh, so we'll now like to open it up for questions from others. We'll, I think everybody is probably accustomed to Zoom world by now, but um, we'll do it by raising uh, our blue hands. Um, I think everybody is probably updated uh, on Zoom by now, but if, if you can't find your raise hand, it might be because the latest update has put it in under reactions. Um, so you'll, uh, you'll find it there. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can also um, direct your questions to the post questions here. Just recognize that we might not get to those ones here today. We'd like to ensure that uh, we get questions from across the university. So we'll, we'll try to keep our answers um, fulsome yet succinct. Um, and if, uh, if you can do the same with your questions, that will allow us to get through, uh, uh, through, more, uh, through more dialogue. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get through everybody before we come back to people that have already spoken. With that, we will start with uh, Shane Day. Looks like you're up first. 
Oh, I'm not aware. Uh, my apologies. I wasn't aware that I had my hand raised. No worries. Anything pop to mind while you're on screen? <laughs> um, like, to be honest, at this point, no. I, just a general comment that I've found the communication around the, uh, around the changes and the transitions um, around IT to be pretty straightforward at this point. Um, I'd certainly like to give a shout out to my manager, Nathan Scredding, for the job he's done communicating the information around this process to us at TLS at Augustana. And yeah, I'm, and with Mike's presentation a week and a half ago to IST that laid out this structure that was presented here more specifically and more in depth. So um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to contribute at this point. Thanks, Todd. That's great. Yeah, thanks, Shane. The, Sh the Shane cameo, we'll call that. Um, I'm going to apologize uh, in advance. Ped Manaham? Since budget cut is one of the keywords of uh, SET, to put the NJT's uh, thing into perspective, we have 35% less staff than what we used to have a year ago. We don't uh, have the numbers for the central IST. Can you share the numbers, how the budget cut has impacted you, how IST has fared in terms of headcount? I uh, just want to make sure I understand your question, uh, Patty. So so what has been the reduction within the central yes. IT function? Yeah. So Mike, you might you might have those numbers exactly. Um, and if you have to fish those out, I'll just buy you a minute here. Um, you know, really, Patty, what's behind your question, I think, is what is happening within the central groups to accommodate uh, movement from across the broader organization? And will there be opportunity for people in faculties and other units to move into the new central structure? Yeah. Um, and the answer to that question is yes. So Again, using my portfolio as an example, my portfolio um, in all areas has reduced um, at the same time, and I would argue uh, in many cases to a greater percentage um, than, than other central units um, or faculties at this point. And the, there's two reasons for that. One, we all have to contribute uh, right now to the budget imperative that we're faced with by the end of this fiscal year. Uh, everybody would know we have to have reduced our our uh, labor costs by uh, an additional $30 million. And so we've done that, IT has done that, finance, HR, um, as has the rest of the organization. But the other side to that is, is that that does allow now the space as we work through the discovery and process redesign um, phases of the project. And as work starts to transition into the center, um, then our very talented staff from other faculties and, and units um, have opportunities then to move into that structure. So that's the general answer. Um, Mike, I don't know if you have the detailed numbers or Brian, if you have the detailed numbers that you'd like to share. Yeah, so I've, I've got some details. I'd like to contextualize it a bit for Patty though, as well as for everybody else. IST has been on a trajectory over actually the last few years to uh, reduce staff and try and maintain services or modify services. So you will have seen changes in IT services provided centrally. Uh, you could. Uh, one example would be printing. That's something that has transitioned. Uh, there have been other transitions in services over these last few years. So it, this hasn't been, for IST anyway, hasn't been a one-year exercise. It's been something that's been in progress for several years now in order to manage budget and to manage services at the same time. So I thought we had arrived and then the provincial budget changed. So I thought we had gotten to where we needed to get to with IST's budget. Over this last fiscal year, we've reduced 31 positions in response to the budget changes, in response to the, the university overall uh, need to manage budget, and also in response to the uniform benchmark, to the uniform baseline numbers that show that university IT overall, not just IST, but university IT overall, the U of A is well above the median in terms of what the institution spends on IT. So there are, there are certainly a couple of motivating factors here, the most immediate one being the provincial budget, but that benchmark really does demonstrate uh, we have been really, really well positioned in terms of IT service provision. So the response necessarily started with the uniform numbers, but uh, we've dovetailed into set and to the GOA budget on that track. Does, does that answer the question, Patty? Yes, it does. Because uh, uh, according to President's uh, uh, 
one of one of the one of the uh, news articles the one of the uh, key parameters was like the head count and uh, what what university of alberta is expecting to reduce so i wanted to know how ist is faring and uh, and uh, how, what's the impact it has yeah yeah so in terms of head count we're doing the same thing as everybody else and in terms of budget overall we were also finding some pretty large reductions in expenditures so for example our our people soft support we're transitioning now to IBM Global from TC from a combination of TCS and IBM and we've we've achieved some very very substantial budget savings in that technical change as well thank you thank you thanks mike and and thanks patty and just because uh, it just uh, t- twigged me when when patty was talking about the the FTE or the headcount but we've referred to it an FTE that's been communicated um, you, you're going to hear me uh, try to um, speak to it more so in the context of the dollars. So you heard me re- refer to the $30 million this year, the $30 million again next year, assuming that nothing further changes in the budget announcement that's coming next week. Um, and the reason that is, is that the, the FTE number that was put out there, it's an important number, but it's, it's predicated on an average annual earnings um, to a calculation that was done now close to a year ago. And, and so as we move through and we learn more, uh, you know, we, we just find out that that average annual earnings uh, was maybe not as accurate as we thought. And so, so we'll focus on the dollars, but, but the key point is um, in that context, just for that messaging, we'll focus on the dollars. It doesn't certainly take away the, the context that we um, are seeing valued members of our community leave the institution. Um, uh, but that that FTE number will will vary, whereas the dollars will hopefully stay relatively consistent. Thank you, Patty. Um, Rick. In the presentation to the Decnal sponsors and the IT staff outside of IST on Friday, February 5th, on slide four, it shows that 46% of the non-central IT staff come from areas with little or no research component. Should those not be segmented out when you presented the slide deck on research, I would like to see a true representation of IT research support from the areas that are actually providing the research support, such as rehab medicine, nursing, Augustana, education, engineering, science, ALS, FOMD, and arts. I feel that the research support on campus is truly larger than what is being depicted in the slides. I was wondering if you could comment on that or actually show us the a true slide showing research support from faculties providing the support. Thank you, Rick. Um, what I know is that I'm not the right one to answer that question, but I'll look to the panel. Um, Michael, maybe start with you unless you would like to refer that to another member. No, no, I'm happy to, happy to start. Um, So research support is actually pretty tough to get hold of. Uh, Rick, looking at it in terms of uh, the faculties you've mentioned would be a good way to to get at it. We don't have that presentation for you. Would certainly be happy to create that and have a look at it with you though. The, The information that was presented to Dean's Council was was really meant to crystallize the findings of what, what was given to us, what was handed off to us during discovery. And so as much as we got from discovery is what we could present around research, further depth in terms of what we have, what we can be provided in terms of support for research would help us actually improve the accuracy of that. So if there, if there are if there are aspects of the research support service in engineering, for example, that you'd be happy to volunteer, that would certainly help in building out the detail of that presentation. Uh, Brian or Rob, did you want to add to that? I think just to build on what you said, Mike, because I um, I think you answered the question very well. Um, one of the things that we also did in the discovery was the the nature of, of research support and what exactly it is. Um, so that's that's something we have to try and and and, and Rick and, and others in uh, supporting research can help us with in terms of the definition of what exactly is the research support, because it seems a bit nebulous at times as to are you supporting researchers or are you supporting research? 
And that isn't always clear. And, and that's something that we have to really understand and get, get to grips with. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Brian, Mike. Um, and again, Rick, uh, offer stands if you want to send something off to Mike and Brian, if, if, if you have some information that would help in, in that further discovery phase, that would be great. Uh, again, we'll apologize in advance if I get this wrong. Is it, is it Weiwei? Yes, it's Weiwei. Um, hi, I'm from the library. And uh, my question, I have several questions, but uh, the first question is to follow up uh, uh, earlier question that uh, you have mentioned that staff will not be replaced in the current ITS structure, IST structure because of the reorganization at the IST level. Uh, but my take is with the new six uh, center of excellence, um, the functions will be consolidated into those six uh, center of excellence. So the, play, the staff will be replaced in this new organization structure. Short answer is yes, but um, I don't know. Let's give Mike a break, uh, Annette. Is, do you want to answer to that one? Sure, I can. So what will happen is as we understand the resource requirements to transition services from different areas to the center to IST, job families will be created and there'll be expressions of interest processes for some of those new required resources to support that. So it depends on what's transitioning, you know, when and what new job families are created. And then the expressions of interest processes will follow through that. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, and another question um, is, I, I think there's have been a service catalog that circulated at the early stage of set. Um, that was of course a very kind of early stage and preliminary draft uh, at that uh, service catalog. It has identified unit level application that supports the enterprise. So I'm just curious about this enterprise application service center that is designed as part of IST. Um, when can we expect to see uh, a service catalog for the center of excellence and understanding where our applications will be fit in there? Because I think there's earlier stack that has shared uh, application is really all over the board, right? So there's um, kind of very specific uh, repeat functionalities, but there's also very unique uh, specific enterprise level um, applications that are supported by other central unit than IST. So I'm just wondering kind of how are we going to make decisions of how those responsibilities are shared or how those are supported? So anyway, Mike, do you want to start with that? And then I, if I picked it up right, there might be something in there for Cheryl as well if she's on. So once you see the old, once you see the more detailed structure that we've reorganized IST into Weiwei, I think a lot of the answers to actually more than just your question, but probably questions other will, others will have, will become a lot clearer. The service catalog, the IT service catalog, just as background, was derived from the Educause IT service catalog. So this isn't something that was just sort of created, uh, bespoke created here at the U of A. This is a service catalog and a series of uh, uh, service descriptions in it that serve institutions, certainly in North America and also globally. So we're relying on that overall structure to build out the IT service catalog here at the U of A. We just finished a revision of that catalog um, and I think either Brian or Glenn would know better than I. Okay, Brian will know better than I how, when, and where that'll be published. So, Brian? Um, in terms of it, one of the things about the catalogs uh, in general is that when we, when we drafted them, um, the, the college structure hadn't been selected. So, therefore, they were, they were drafted in, in the absence of that. Um, and now we're introducing the college structure, and we have to redraft them with that in place. Having said that, the IT, the IT hasn't got a lot in, in that area, so therefore we, we're believing that we can do the IT one uh, and expedite it relatively quickly. Uh, others are, are more um, complex in relation to where the, the college um, model uh, might, might play with, with the current distribution. So um, we don't believe there's going to be huge impacts on, on what's currently distributed uh, within the, the, the catalog. Uh, but I can't give you a specific date because we are working with the college deans on that at the moment to see uh, what their 
uh, perspective is on it. But that's why they um, they sort of got a bit delayed. Brian, Mike, thank you, Weiwei. Um, I've, I've just had one come in electronically here, and I'm says, um, can you please give us some examples of IT services that will not be centralized, i.e. they will stay in the faculties and or other units like advancement services, for example? I would go back to Rick's question of our research support. For me, coming from science, the, the most immediate, the best example I can give you is, is the interfacing and support for a dedicated piece of research equipment. So if you've got a mass spec that, that's sitting in a research lab, absolutely the support for that mass spec would stay in, in the faculty. That's not something that we can bring into central IT that we can support in any kind of scalable fashion because there's probably one mass spec of each vintage scattered around scattered around the university. So there will be no sort of central support for those kinds of very specialized research functions. That's the best, the, the crispest uh, example I can give you. Thank you, Mike. And, and if I can, I'll just, I'll just add because sometimes behind the scenes of questions like this are a concern about what it might mean for one's career options or opportunities when you come to the, you know, quote unquote, the center. Um, and, and many would have this belief that it's, um, that it's a negative, uh, that, it might, that it might stunt opportunities. Um, I've only been here a short time, but, but I certainly uh, think I understand that our, um, our, our organization as individuals, we, we have a loyalty, rightly so, to our faculties or to our units. And, and we haven't traditionally had a view to... Um, you know, raising our, our talent up, if you will, and enabling them to move across boundaries at the institutional level. And I think that that set at its core accomplishes that or helps us get there. And, and the few people that I've talked to that have had concerns, what I've said is I think it actually opens up opportunity. I think it provides more opportunity for both experience, exposure. Um, you, can, uh, you can take your career vertically, you can take it horizontally. Uh, maybe you you come and spend some time in a central team and decide that with the experience you gain and the exposure that you gain, maybe you go back into a different role in one of the other faculties or units or now colleges. So, um, so I would I would encourage people that you know are maybe thinking that behind the scenes of questions like this. I'm happy to chat more offline as well if you'd like to, but I encourage you to uh, to see the the opportunity that lies within uh, this new structure. Uh, Kamal, let's go to you. Thank you, uh, Todd, Mike, and everyone uh, for setting this, uh, setting up this uh, presentation and then the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, my name is Kamal. I am I'm from the Arts Resource Center, which is a service unit within the Faculty of Arts. Um, I have actually uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is fairly straightforward. The second one is, I believe, a little bit more faceted. So I will start with uh, rather the simple one. Um, Question is like when we consider IT consolidation and IT services, uh, how do we look at multimedia, for example? Uh, is multimedia services considered IT services, or would they be considered? Would it be considered uh, differently from the focus area of the set IT uh, transformation here? So that's one question. First question. So do we want to answer that first and then go to the next one? Why don't you throw out both, Kamal, and then we'll take them both at the same time? Absolutely. So the second question is related to more about application development. I would actually relate this to the work that we do through our team because that gives us a little bit of a context than asking the question abstract. So in our team, we provide we do applications development for research as well as we have been doing applications development of a fairly diverse areas of administrative needs that are not supported by the central enterprise level applications. And I'm wondering, like, what what what's the what's the solution that's available? For example, with this uh, centralization, like, would there be other central solutions existing, or or would we be basically integrating this these kind of services into the centrally provide uh, service model? For example, things like payment support 
and we do things like workflow management support for and grant applications and things like that. These can definitely be valuable administrative tools that are not specifically for arts, but more general. I'm just wondering, like, where would be the, the for example, house for these kind of things, or would they be part of the vision in centralization? Thanks, Kamel. Um, Mike, I'm going to start you with both of those, and you can redirect as you uh, feel necessary. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, Kamel, you picked a small one and a big one, <laughs> either end of the spectrum here. So just as clarification, when you say multimedia, I'm, I'm hearing audiovisual and I'm thinking classroom support. Is that what you're thinking? Uh, no, actually, this is uh, this is not classroom support. This is uh, audiovisual support for provided for research conferences. And for example, right now, these Zoom sessions are provided by the multimedia people of our Arts Resource Center. So where those kind of services will stay, those are not the standard classroom support. This is everything but that. Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Thanks for the clarification. So we do support remote delivery. We do support video conferencing currently within the digital learning environment port portfolio. That's the portfolio that currently manages all the Zoom all the University of Alberta Zoom licenses and uh, and webinars. So so there is a group in in the DLE uh, center of expertise that that does that kind of support and will build out further support. So you have to imagine as we move further into remote delivery that we have to ensure that we have techniques that enable student engagement. For example, you know it's it's not enough just to throw Zoom at people all day. You have, to, you have to engage them. You have to have additions to those environments to actually bring them in and, and ensure the learning. And then you have to have some way to inform instructors about, well, where are the students, you know, in terms of their engagement with your course? You can't, you can't be standing there at the front of the class as the students come in or watch them as you're, as you're pitching a lecture or pitching some, you know, pitching some group activities. It's really, really difficult in remote delivery. So, so to your question, yes, yes, and yes, all along those timelines and all along those evolutions of what we're doing as an institution. So I hope that handles the small question because there's a, there's a large discussion there and I'd love to, I'd love to have that. For your big question on application development, what you've, what you've chosen is the most contextualized, the most varied, and, and, and the, the most challenging part of this whole IT transition conversation. That's an area where we will have to be engaged very closely, very deeply with people like you, with all the units to find out what is it that people are developing? You know, maybe there are three or four different payment gateways that, that are being used. And maybe they're being used in fairly similar ways. If that's the case, then we can aggregate them. If they're being used in different ways, you know, so, so supporting conferences and supporting uh, music uh, presentations, very, very different challenge than, than supporting payments for uh, merchandise of various types or, or for kits for the dental students, for example. So, it's those conversations that give us opportunities to aggregate services and decrease costs by comparing what everybody's doing so that we're not all off having to reinvent and then resupport everywhere. I wish I could give you a really simple answer, but it's a really big question and it will be a really big part of the activity here, Kamal. And if that's okay, if I just add a one little thing on both of the answers, I just wanted to make sure it, it's actually taken into consideration and the attention. So regarding this, the answer to the simple question, great, thank you so much. And, and uh, regarding the multimedia question, one thing I want to add is that when it comes to providing multimedia support, that's a huge component related to project management and then also providing the expert advice. And, yeah. and and so it goes well beyond the standard well beyond the standard classroom support or the teaching support or remote delivery sometimes there are the complex uh, other attributes that we need to consider then i think i think in the decision making process if there's interest to uh, consult on those things we are definitely happy to help because if you exclude that one that that can potentially lead to the the deterioration of the services ultimately rendered Regarding the payment one, and then some other administrative applications as well, you are absolutely right. The, the, the actual 
end users can be substantially different but if you work with the right architecture they all can actually be supported by the underlying platform that's what we have been actually doing within the payment system we have we actually have merchandise support as well as even the different kind of customization so obviously this is not the place to wind up the answer when but i just wanted to uh, ask those kind of questions just to figure out where this would fit thank you so much yeah, and yeah. i have to support anytime please feel free to uh, reach out thank you absolutely will Kamel, and it absolutely needs that further discussion and engagement with you thank you okay thank you Kamel. thank you mike uh, we're getting close to the end of our time we're going to move on to uh last hand up here is dan moore hey yeah i might have to modify my question a little bit based on uh what happened with Kamal's question. Um, on his second question, uh, is it the case then that we're not really super close to being ready to move people since we don't seem to appear to be 100% yet on what everyone's doing and therefore like what supports need to be, need to still be there once we move centrally? Um, uh, so I'll, kind of this, I'll maybe answer that in just a couple of phases. I'll give you a general answer, then I'm gonna uh, kick it over to Brian or Rob for a little bit more detail and then Mike, but um, but it was spoken to earlier, right? We've, we've just finished the discovery phase for IT. Now we move into the phase that's called process redesign, have to understand how we're going to offer all these services across the organization. And then a number of months down the road, I wanna say it's like around July is when we start to see that uh, transitioning over. But, uh, Rob, you haven't had an opportunity to unmute. Um, have I got that generally correct? Uh, yes, yeah, you have that generally correct, but I saw Brian unmuted, so I think he wants to, yep. to weigh in here. Okay. Uh, it, it's there, There's a difference with, with, with IT because the process, we're not doing um, as much process redesign with IT. It's more transition into the center. So, so that redesign phase... Uh, it isn't really very long in the IT world. It's mainly discovery and then transition. Um, Glenn, Glenn is working on that transition. I think the roadmap is, is, is developed and they're beginning to, uh, to share it with, with each of the groups that many of you are part of uh, at this meeting. And we will be moving uh, people into the centre uh, relatively soon, in, in fact, as we go through them. And the roadmap will be, will be shared with you over the next couple of weeks and then you'll, you'll have a much better idea of, of how they're doing it. Um, but it is, it is not, it, it is very quickly. So not all at once, there'll be, there'll, it'll be over a period of time, but we will start relatively soon. Uh, Mike Glenn. Yeah, I may have muddled things a bit, Dan, in my, in my comments about applications. There are certainly areas where it would be very quick, the opportunity to move people into central. So for example, service desk, network, those kinds of things. Are, are, are much less contextual, much more straightforward. The application development piece of it, much, much more detailed, and that'll be later. Glenn, did you wanna add? I, I, I think you've, you've caught it well, Mike. Um, there are some things that are, like you say, that are relatively straightforward, uh, and I think makes sense for most people from a, a central service support perspective, but like you say, applications definitely more complex. Thanks. Dan, was there more to that question? I feel like I might have cut you off. Yeah, it's okay. Maybe just slightly. Um, just, okay, once, I'm just wondering also, once we actually do start moving people and maybe people aren't doing 100% of what they used to be, I just want to know, like, what, if you can speak at all to um, sort of how we're going to ensure successful handoff of responsibilities. Or are we just going to tell certain clients support they used to receive is now going to be requested through IST? And if IST can't do it or after some host downsize, you know, uh, if no one knows anything about that specific software, or just, we're just going to be telling some people that they're out of luck. And if that's the case, are we prepared to deal with some of the emergencies that might arise from that as something unexpected breaks or things that needed to be done, you know, that they only realized that week and then they have no support fail, you know, what, what's kind of our plan on that? Okay. Yeah, my plan is to rely on making sure we get the service desk in place and solid because that's how we find out all those things. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm from from my my selfish perspective, I'm really really focused on service desk to make sure that we do have those points of contact with everybody in the community. 
there will be bumps. Those will be inevitable. And we need to find out quickly as, as you've stressed them. There will also be places where services must change. That's one of the consequences of, of the whole budget challenge here. We cannot just continue going on doing what we've doing, been doing with fewer people, with fewer services, with reduced base. We just can't do that. So there are things that will have to change and there are services that will have to change. Thanks, Mike. And, and thanks, Dan. And I think the only thing that I'll maybe add just to that, uh, it's a great question, Dan. And, um, and as Mike says, we're going to have some bumps, right? I, I mean, we, we would be naive to think that we won't. I mean, we're, we're moving through a significant transition. However, um, it is most, most certainly our goal um, that, that we don't let things fall through the cracks. Um, and, you know, we would we would never tell somebody, you know, sort of too bad you're on your own, right? That's, that's not the intention of this, but to Mike's point, we will have to understand what those things are that might be surprises and we will have to work through whatever the appropriate transition is with our clients. Um, and, uh, and we do need to change the way that we do things, um, how we do them, who does them, maybe the processes and systems that we use to do them. Um, but uh, but this isn't just a, a you know a cut and run exercise, if you will. We will shepherd the institution through this change. So um, thank you uh, all. Um, I'll just wrap up. We're just right at our uh, time commitment. I do do want to thank everybody for coming um, and sharing your honest questions. I know that there are some more that have come in electronically, and the team will work to get those answers uh, back out to folks. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the set team, our panelists, uh, Claire, Grant, uh, and our uh, ASL interpreters, uh, Pam and Jason, and of course, everyone else um, that's helped pull together today's session. We will be updating our frequently asked questions page at the uh, University, for Alberta, University of Alberta for tomorrow um, website um, with questions and answers from today. We, we do try to build on that after each one of these sessions so that we can communicate uh, that important information. Um, if you do have further questions for the SET team, please feel free to use the SET feedback form, um, which can be found on the SET website uh, and will also be in the post event survey that you'll receive shortly. And, and thank you to uh, all of you that can take the time to fill that out. We do take that feedback very importantly and uh, are very seriously and, and work to build it into the next, uh, next round of these meetings. We will continue to schedule our Ask SET Anything events um, for the remaining streams, um, we'll, we'll post these dates on the UAT webpage as they're scheduled. Um, our next confirmed session for Ask Said Anything is for uh, shared services, um, and that's taking place on Friday, March uh, 12th from 2 to 3. Um, we will also have, um, you know, uh, ongoing IT sessions as we move through. I believe I mentioned that earlier. The, uh, the Zoom recording for this event will be posted on the UAT website for uh, later viewing for those of you uh, or for those that couldn't attend, not those of you, but those that could not attend, we invite them to, uh, to watch the recording. With that, I will conclude things. Again, thank you all uh, very much and uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions that weren't asked and answered today. Take care.